Our text for the sermon this morning is from 2 Kings 4. Verse 38 to 44. During the ministry of Elisha, the prophet, And Elisha came again to Gilgal when there was a famine in the land. And as the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, he said to his servant, Set on the large pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophets. One of them went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered from it in his lap full of wild gourds and came and cut them up into the pot of stew not knowing what they were. And they poured out some for the men to eat. But while they were eating of the stew, they cried out, O man of God, there is death in the pot. And they could not eat it. He said, Then bring flour. He threw it into the pot and said, Pour some out for the men that they may eat. And there was no harm in the pot. A man came from Baal Shalisha, bringing the man of God bread of the first fruits, twenty loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. And Elisha said, Give to the men that they may eat. But his servant said, How can I set this before a hundred men? So he repeated, Give them to the men that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, They shall eat and have some left. So he said it before them, and they ate and had some left, according to the word of the Lord. After we listen to God's word, we'll sing of God's great faithfulness in hymn 66. Beloved in Christ, the economy isn't always robust and strong. There are times when property values go down and inflation goes up. Times when jobs are hard to get and our money doesn't go as far. Tough times should make everyone pause to consider the source of the things that we have, to reflect on how much we actually need to depend on God and how we should ask God to provide us with what we need. The two stories on our text teach those basic truths in a memorable way. The stories are connected because both of them are about food. In the background of the two stories this morning, there was a famine in Israel. There had been a famine in Israel before during the ministry of Elijah. That was three and a half years God displaying his covenant wrath. He judged the people for rejecting him. In his great mercy, God brought that famine to an end. But God's people are slow to learn. Now there's another famine for Israel is still determined to worship her idols. A period of famine means that food is in short supply. There hasn't been rain, so the crops aren't growing. And if the crops aren't growing, then the storehouses of grain and barley and olive oil are gradually going to be depleted until there's nothing left. The cupboard is bare. We said that there are times for us too, maybe in your own life, you've experienced it, times of less work. Times when the cash reserves are getting dangerously low. You wonder what hardship is next. What's your capacity to bear another hardship? But the good news is that God is ever faithful. God sees through the anxieties and the sufferings of his people. And he promises to care for us. 
For our God is not too mighty and not too glorious to be concerned about something as small as our daily bread. In our text, that message comes across loud and clear. And in it, there's an encouraging message for us all. So I preach God's word to you from 2 Kings 4. God generously feeds his hungry people through Elisha. We'll look at the salvaged stew, the abundant bread, and the living lessons. The stew, first of all. In our text, we meet the prophet Elisha. A servant of God, he was sent to many places to bring a word from the Lord, a traveling preacher. Now today, he's in Gilgal, verse 38 says, which is to the south of the land, not far from Jericho. And we learn in verse 38 that there was a famine in the land. Probably not the same famine, or it was not the same famine as a three and a half year one, but the famine probably described in 2 Kings 8, which says there was a seven year famine in Israel. And we just said a famine was one way by which God rebuked the people's sin. God was disciplining them in love. We can be sure that this famine, twice as long as the earlier one, was deserved. God is putting the pressure onto his people. He wants them to learn to count the cost of rejecting him. He wants them to repent from sin and return to him. Now, one thing about these famines is that they didn't just affect the ungodly in the land, but everyone, even the faithful few, had to deal with the fallout of Israel's sin. That's really the nature of sin still today, isn't it? It's so hard to contain it. Sin spreads its misery widely. God has said he will never punish one person for the sin of another person, And yet the fact is, one person's sin can bring grief to a whole lot of others. They can affect an innocent party, a bystander, a member of the family. Some sins have consequences that are so widespread. Well, that's what we see in verse 38. A famine in the land, and this punishment has an effect on the righteous man, Elisha, and the righteous sons of the prophets. For they are sitting together... And they are hungry. Now just a quick note about these sons of the prophets. Both stories in our text involve this group. The sons of the prophets were collections of faithful people in Israel. There was a culture of godlessness in the land. But these were men who still wanted to learn about the ways of the Lord. They would gather around the prophets of God to be instructed by them. We read that the sons of the prophets are sitting before Elisha. That probably means they're receiving instruction. Just picture a kindergarten classroom, if you will, a teacher at the front on her stool and all the children sitting around her on the floor without desks and chairs. This was a good way for the sons of the prophets to listen to Elisha sitting on the ground in front of him. The prophet's school is in session. But every teacher knows that it's hard to keep your students' attention if they have missed breakfast and their stomachs are rumbling. If you get hungry enough, it's hard to think about anything besides getting some food into your belly. It might be that Elisha realizes this for As he gives his lesson, he tells his servant, set on the large pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophets. Maybe Elisha has some food of his own or he knows where to get some. He tells his servant to go and make some stew or a thick soup. You'll know from church potlucks that soup is always good for sharing. If you make a big pot, then everyone can dip in and enjoy. This is probably the kind of meal that the sons of the prophets and Elisha had enjoyed together many times before. As they worshipped and as they studied, they enjoyed fellowship 
at a meal. So the stew is being prepared. We learn that one of the men goes out into the field to gather herbs. Maybe the stew is looking a bit thin. You're looking for something to make it go further, something to spice it up a little. But the pickings are slim. If you scrounge around in a time of famine, you're not likely to get much. But then the man finds a wild vine. It says, and he gathered from it his lap full of wild gourds. And he came and cut them up into the pot of stew. We don't know for sure what it was that he found, but apparently there are some small melons that grow in the wild in Israel. Things like wild cucumbers, or there's these yellow colored melons that are called the apple of Sodom. The apple of Sodom. It's not really a promising name. They say that people would use these wild melons as a laxative. And when they were eaten in large quantities, they could even be fatal. Adding the gourds to the pot, it says the man did not know what they were, and neither did anyone else. The men were hungry, and that made them careless, perhaps. They were eager, so eager to have a good meal. It's such a human story, isn't it? A story that we can relate to. People getting carried away, not thinking things through. That's realistic. This will be a story about what God is doing, not what people do. But there's still a truth here about how even with the very best of intentions, like that man, we can make bad mistakes. We want to help someone out. We want to serve in the church. But we're limited in our knowledge or our ability. Maybe our words are careless. Our decisions are all wrong. Sometimes it feels like we do more harm than good. That's not a reason not to try, of course. It is good to serve, but we should do it with humility. We depend on God always to make the most of our weaknesses. Actually, it's really good to know that our mistakes are never bad enough. They're never bad enough to ruin God's work. God is always greater. And he's going to show that. God is always wiser. God can bring something good even out of our disasters. So we should commit all our ways and all our doings to him. So back to the story. As dinner is served, as they pour some out for the men to eat, says, while they were eating of the stew, they cried out, O man of God, there is death in the pot. Everyone suddenly realizes that the soup of the day is very bad. Maybe they gag or they choke. They feel their insides begin to churn. At any rate, it's clear that this meal is unpalatable, if not lethal. Some have wondered when they read this, they wonder if that's an exaggeration. Is there death in the pot? And did they expect Elisha actually to do something about it? Was that really a concern for the holy man of God? Well, the important point is at the end of verse 40, where it says, and they could not eat it. If your dad barbecues burgers for Sunday dinner, and burns them so badly that they're inedible. It's a waste, but it's not a crisis. There's more food in the freezer or pantry. But for Elisha and the sons of the prophets, a spoiled stew is terrible. Remember, there's a famine going on. If all this food is ruined, it's a big loss. Now, what are they going to eat? It's like how another person's needs can appear frivolous to us at first. Maybe we hear about a family struggling, we see long faces at church, and we wonder if it really is so bad for them. Maybe they're exaggerating, we think. They're overdoing it. But when we know all the facts, 
like in this story. When we know the whole story, these needs can take on a new urgency. This was a crisis. If there was no stew, there was nothing else. And the good news is that we are allowed to pray for the small gifts that we need. Our God has promised to care for these things too. The Lord Jesus teaches us to pray each day for our daily bread. And in a way, beloved, it's hard to think of what's more ordinary, what's more routine than the things that we eat every day. What you had for breakfast this morning, or your salad at lunchtime, or spaghetti on the stove tonight, those are such small things. But we still need to ask for our daily bread because it's required. If we are going to serve God well, we need to eat. If a man won't eat, he can't work. And we remember it comes from God, the fount of every blessing. And so the men are right to involve the prophet, and the prophet uses his God given ability to improve, to salvage the stew. It's an act of mercy and necessity. He says, bring some flour. Elisha did something similar at Jericho in 2 Kings 2. Remember the waters in Jericho were poisoned and Elisha used some salt to heal the poisoned waters. That didn't mean it was magical salt used by Elisha, or that this was supernatural flour, but it would drive home the miracle. Making it visible would hold it in people's memories for a long time, kind of like the sacraments, the baptism and Lord's Supper, a visible sign, an outward act, pointing to the great works of God. Elisha takes that flour and he puts it into the pot. And then he says, pour some out for the men that they may eat. And notice the confidence of the prophet. Mix it in and let them eat. He has no doubt that God can do this. And God is able. After adding the flour, there was no harm in the pot. For that is what God does. He faithfully feeds his people. That's the salvaged stew. Well, story number two in this set begins with a remarkable act of gratitude. Verse 42 reports that a man came from Baal Shalisha, bringing the man of God bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. This was something that God commanded the people to do. The law in Leviticus and Deuteronomy said that the Israelites had to bring God their first fruits or the very first share of the crops. So an Israelite might go out to his field of harvest with his basket of produce, fill it up, and then go from his field straight to the tabernacle because he wanted to present this gift to the Lord at once. Do it first, before he starts filling his barns, because he wants to show gratitude to God. Everything we receive has come from God, so we want to give back to him. That's what the man in verse 42 is doing. God has blessed him, and he is thankful. But notice, he brings the first fruits to Elisha, and not to the priest, That's what was required by the law, that the gift went to the sanctuary. But the man probably didn't want to bring this gift to the local priest because many of them had simply gone in the same way of Israel and her idolatry. For now, Elisha was God's representative in the land. And notice how this nameless man is determined to be faithful. Think of it, he's living in a culture of hatred for God and his ways. But this solitary man 
continues to serve the Lord. It's another reminder, isn't it, of how God is always busy among his people. He's preserving his own, even in perilous times, even today. This man will be faithful. And his act was one of remarkable gratitude, we said. This was a sacrificial gift. In a time of famine, think of it, giving away 20 loaves of barley bread and a sack of grain, that would have taken great faith. This man didn't know what the future held. He didn't know if he would have a good harvest again next year. He didn't know how long these hard times would last, but it doesn't matter. He's thankful to God today, and so he will bring his gift to God today. That teaches us about the spirit which should mark our lives. When we have been blessed by God our Father, it delights him when we are cheerful givers. A cheerful giver is exactly that. Someone who gives happily. Who gives eagerly. And yet when we give to the Lord, it's always easy to think about several reasons to hold back. I could spend this money on something else. Times are tough. Interest rates are going up. Inflation's getting bad. Maybe it's better that I save this than give it away. Right now, I can give only a little, and a little is hardly worth it. So I won't give it. Beloved, I understand that everyone has choices to make about giving. These choices require from us godly wisdom. Our jobs are different. Our needs vary. And so the size of one person's gift can be very different from another. Yet nothing takes away that core Christian calling that we be thankful. Nothing removes it. And everything commends it to us as the right thing to do, to worship our great God through our gratitude. Giving requires wisdom, I said, and perhaps more than that, it requires trust. Trust that God will keep providing for us, just as he said. Trust that God will bless our obedience even when it's hard. Trust is hard because it means letting go. Sometimes letting go of the money and the time and the control that we want to keep for ourselves. Well, this man in our text trusts God and he gives his first fruits. And Elisha does, just like what faithful priests were supposed to do, he shares this gift. He says, give the gift to the men that they may eat. That's when Elisha's servant becomes skeptical. He says, how can I set this before a hundred men? For one man, 20 loaves was a lot. For a hundred men, 20 loaves is very little. It's the smallest of appetizers. This bread can only go so far. If the previous story in this set was about harmful food, this one is about insufficient food. Once again, Elisha sees an opportunity to act, so he gives a command, the same one as with the stew. He says, give to the men that they may eat. This time there's no outward act, there's no symbolism. Just a simple order. Eat. A simple command. But it has a powerful backing. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left. God's message to the prophet is straightforward and it comes true. They ate and had some left. Verse 44, according to the word of the Lord. And you can underline that last phrase, according to the word of the Lord. 
God's word is truth. God's word is more important, more trustworthy, more satisfying than anything in this world that you can acquire or hold in your hand or store up for tomorrow. If God gives you a promise, God will keep that promise. The story of the abundant bread reminds us of miracles that Jesus performed, feeding the 5,000, the 4,000. On those occasions, he had people around him too, just like Elisha did, receiving instruction, but hearing their stomachs rumbling. And then too, Jesus did not have much to begin with, five loaves, two small fish, even less than Elisha with a far bigger crowd to feed too. And Jesus' disciples too were skeptical about how all this was going to work. We have only a bit of food. How are we supposed to share all this around? But Christ is always sufficient, even when we are at our emptiest. He just starts handing out the loaves and the fish And the entire crowd of several thousand gets to eat. There is even plenty left over. If people on that day had thought of 2 Kings 4, they would have seen it crystal clear. Someone greater than Elisha is here. Here is a teacher who cares for his students. Here is a Lord who provides. A Savior who saves Well, what are some lessons that we can draw? One lesson from these two stories is that life is fragile. It was hard to forget that in Israel. The whole economy was tied closely to agriculture. If rains came on time, then life was good. But drought or crop failure meant disaster loomed. For many people, hard times were never very far away. For us, beloved, life is still fragile. But we can push that reality far from our minds. Our lives are safe and well-ordered. We are well wrapped up with insurance and backup plans and government assistance. In terms of food, too, we are used to having pantries full, freezers full, and plenty more at Costco in 10-pound quantities. But our text teaches us to look behind all the food on our shelves past that varied menu that we enjoy each week and to look to God who sustains our fragile lives. He richly provides all things. It sounds like such a simple lesson, the kind of thing that a parent would tell their three-year-old, God gave you this sandwich and this banana. Simple. But are we really so good at remembering that lesson? Do we show a true gratitude to our Father for his simple gifts? It's part of Jesus' prayer for a good reason. Give us today our daily bread. Every day we ought to pray that petition. And every day we should notice how God answered it. Today is another day where we have our food. Maybe it's not our favorite meal. Maybe we wish that we could have had a bit more But it still came from the Father as a gift of his love. So we give thanks to him. We thank him with our words and thank him by our deeds. And looking to God to provide us with what we need is so important because it's also a lesson of trust. The man who brought God his first fruits in a time of famine showed deep dependence on God. Whatever was going to happen in the future, he was sure 
God would care for him. And we need that same kind of trust. Consider God's words in Deuteronomy 8. In that passage, Moses is reminding Israel about how God sustained them through their long journey through the wilderness. He gave them water. He gave them manna. He didn't let their clothes or their shoes wear out. And Moses says all that provision from God had a powerful lesson, a lesson for us too, that you might know man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Manna every morning was a confirmation that God was caring for them, daily proof that God is trustworthy and faithful and good, that we live by his word and by his grace. In 2 Kings 4, God salvaged the stew and multiplied the bread. But we know God doesn't always do that for his children. There is rarely a miracle like this anymore. You probably know this. There is sometimes a pressing need that's not met in the way we expected. Sometimes God's children lose everything. Sometimes we do run stuck. God doesn't protect us from all trouble, but he does say that he knows what we need even before we ask him. He is a father who loves us dearly in Christ. He is a father who loves us and in his care, we can always be content. That's the spirit. That's the lesson about how God wants us to live. Trusting him. Holding on to every word that comes from his mouth. Believing his promise because you know your God will not lie. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about next year. But hold on to God's promise for today. His promise in Jesus Christ that he is with you and will not forsake you. Amen.